So hello, ma'am. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, on the occasion of International Women's Day, ET Legal World from Economic Times is honored to host an exclusive interview with Ms. Sanjeet Kaur Batra, Group Vice, Pre Vice President Legal and Legal Head of Cumans India. In a world where women continue to defy stereotypes and shatter glass ceilings, Ms. Batra stands out as an inspiration in the realm of corporate legal, uh, legal leadership. Ms. Batra has worked extensively on cross-border M&A, uh, restructuring transactions, and interest, corporate advisory, corporate governance, litigation, as well as intellectual property-related issues. During her private practice tenure, she advised stakeholders from multiple industries. She's actively involved in policy advocacy as a member of various committees of leading industries association in India. As we celebrate the achievements and contributions of women across diverse industries. This special interview delves into the journey of a seasoned legal professional who has not only navigated the intricacies of the legal landscape, but has also left an indelible mark as a trailblazer in her field. Thank you so much, ma'am, for joining us today. Thank you so much, Malvika, for having me here. Okay. Uh, so starting with, as a legal uh, head, you hold a prominent position in a corporate legal world. So can you share us some insight into your journey and key milestones that has shaped your career? Uh, sure, happy to. So it's been a pretty interesting and uh, unconventional journey. I started my career as a litigator. And when I was in law school, the only thing I knew about in the legal profession was to be a litigator. But as I joined the profession, you know, various avenues opened up. And after doing a couple of years of hardcore litigation, I experimented a little bit with uh, uh, being on the civil society side and then got an opportunity to work with an IP law firm, spent quite a few years there, and then had an opportunity to work with the U.S. government as a part of their USPTO International Policy Office. Okay. Um, yeah, it's been a pretty interesting journey in terms of uh, the diversity of work, the avenues, and just the, you know, the plethora of opportunity that this profession yeah. has to offer. Uh, after being in the U.S. government for a few years, I got an opportunity to go in-house. And uh, since then have been, uh, you know, in-house and spent a lot of my time. Almost the last decade has been with DuPont and for the past almost three years have been with Cummins now. So uh, the learning has been that uh, never say no. Because, uh, you know, yeah. when we are students and we don't know what the real world is all about, we have this image of what the profession is all about. But mm -hmm. uh, if one has the courage to sign up for different adventures, yeah. a city in the legal profession is just amazing. Yeah, true, true, true. Uh, so um, can you share us some insights into the efforts that Human India is making to promote diversity and inclusion? As an organization, we are very committed to having a diverse, equitable, and inclusive world. And uh, I must say, it gives me a great sense of pride that uh, uh, as an organization, we are striving to achieve 50% gender equity, uh, You know, just having equal representation. And uh, even when I joined the organization, it was amazing because the number of women that were there in the leadership team, it mm -hmm. was unusual. Uh, mm -hmm. Currently, our global CEO is also a woman. For the first mm -hmm. time uh, in our more than 100 years of history, for the first time, we have a woman leading the organization globally. And it gives us a great sense of pride. And some of the things that uh, as an organization we are very focused on is taking bet on talent. Uh, irrespective of gender, but that, of course, is uh, something that really speaks well for the organization. Also, yeah. just having women leaders, because nothing uh, helps the younger generation more than to have women who are there in the senior position, because then you form your own networks, you have uh, people who have kind of walked on the same path that you're currently on. Yeah. And uh, uh, we just promote a very equitable culture. Uh, so gender mm -hmm. is one important part, but generally we, as an organization, we are very focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion for different segments. Okay, okay. 
That's really great. And um, having said that, I read a like gender gap report of 2022, which said ki the wage gap uh, in humans is just 3.9%. And which is really, compared to other uh, corporates, that is really a great number. But having said that, with same set of skills and same education and same amount of hard work, why do you think that there is this you know, pay parity that is existing? Even if it's 3.9%, then why is that like, the situation why is that the situation i think the a lot of it is just to do with the way uh the society has been and uh again it's more of a stereotype that yeah. women traditionally have not been as good at negotiation for salary <laughs> as men i think we are all uh, evolving uh we are mm -hmm. learning our experiences but uh, it's just the way the society has been. And what I personally experience now is that there is a lot of uh, equality that is coming in, especially mm -hmm. when I talk about the in-house world, you know, uh, mm -hmm. in a lot of organizations, there's not much focus on gender. It's more merit-based. Yeah. And uh, even in Cummins, we are making, uh, you know, a very deliberate attempt to make sure that there's absolutely no gap uh, when it comes to, you know, whether it's gender, whether it is race, etc. So there's yeah. been a lot of deliberate focus on this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, from your perspective, like what advancements have you witnessed in the legal industry, particularly in terms of gender diversity during your career? So since when I joined the profession, uh, it was a very different world, uh, you know, being a lawyer and being a woman was yeah. supposed to be, oh, how is that going to work out? But now we see so many girls signing up for being lawyers and it's very yeah. hard. Uh, you know, I, I was just reading somewhere that probably we now have more girls trying to get into law schools than mm -hmm. boys. And yeah. uh, I'm very hopeful that over the next few years, we will start seeing the results of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just bringing in that balance in the society. Yeah. Uh, there, in the bar, I think we still have a lot less representation of women. But uh, in the corporate world, you know, when we talk of law firms, when we talk of uh, uh, just in-house, etc., I see a lot more women there. And yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the two factors that I would uh, say have been prominent in making this changes, I think one is just the evolution of the society. Our mm. uh, new gen is not willing to sign up for the uh, traditional biases, the traditional stereotypes, etc. And yeah. second, I think just the whole conversation about making the world a better place, you know, focusing mm -hmm. gender and equity and inclusion. Uh, a lot of organizations are now being uh, driven by numbers that, you know, okay, it's good to talk, but what are the numbers that we are talking about? How many women do you actually have in the organization? What are the steps that you are taking to achieve it? And those are uh, being very helpful. And of course, now uh, when we have our current chief justice, who's, you know, such a mm. uh, big proponent of gender equality and encouraging yeah. women to sign up, uh, I think it's helping move the society in the right direction. Yeah, uh, you just said ki in le in legal like in corporate uh you know legal profession we see fairly amount of uh, girls working there, but when it comes to practicing in courts we just have around uh, roughly if I remember the number it's just fifteen percent. So why is it that in your opinion? So Malvika, uh, it is a tough profession whether it is in house whether it is you know as a practicing lawyer, but uh, and setting up your own practice, unless you come from a family of lawyers, is never easy. True. And uh, also, when we look at the bar, it is still male-dominated. And you don't have a corporate-like setup where people are trying to encourage women to sign up, yeah, yeah, yeah. to make strides. It is not... a uh, you know, you don't have a HR, you don't have other uh, functions that are focusing on building that kind of a, a gender diversity in the profession. Uh, and that is probably one of the reasons why we don't have as many women who are practicing. But again, with 
the steps that have recently been made, you know, the number of women who have been, uh, uh, who have just joined the bench, for example, yeah, these yeah, are yeah. inspirational stories. And slowly, you know, these are the role models that are going to inspire the younger generation to stay with the profession and excel in it. Very well said. Uh, so this was a personal question. Who has, whether in or out, the legal profession has been an inspiration or a mentor to you in your career or in your life for that matter? So too many of them to count. Uh, I'll, of course, start by saying uh, my parents, of course, were the biggest inspiration because they have made me who I am. Right from the beginning, they were very clear that uh, you, know, you have to be independent, uh, take charge of your destiny, etc. So it was never a, uh, you know, it was never a dilemma in my mind that I will not have a career. Uh, mm -hmm. That has always been very clear. And then when I joined the profession, I think in my formative years, I've had some incredible bosses. You know, the work ethics that I've learned from them uh, and just expectation from yourself about, you know, when you're delivering to a client uh, and the fact that as lawyers, you also need to be morally and ethically extremely strong. Mm -hmm. so just in my formative years, uh, you know, my bosses, who I actually consider my gurus, have really helped set the foundation. And okay. after that, uh, I think it's just been pretty much all the organizations. You work with different set of people, uh, whether it's the CEOs of my organization have taken a bet on me, you know, encouraged me to step out of my comfort zone, given me challenging assignments when I personally thought I was not ready for them, but they're like, go ahead and do it. Okay. So, you know, and my teams, you know, legal colleagues, the teams, the younger lawyers, anybody who's committed to the whatever profession they are in, I think there's inspiration to be found everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people like you inspire me as like as a girl and as a woman a lot to, you know, work towards my dreams. So having said that about the ethics and um, morals that you were uh, telling us about, do you ever face this ethical dilemma when uh, since a lot of corporate companies are, you know, uh, hiring in-house legal team. So do you face this ethical dilemma whether to do what's best for the company or to uphold the laws or the ethics? Do you face this ethical dilemma any anytime? I think it's not a choice. You have to uphold the law of the land. That's a non-negotiable for any lawyer who's you know, who's working anywhere, basically. We are the guardians of an organization. Mm -hmm. uh, having said that, many a times, you also have to find ways of helping the business understand that you can still do business while clearly being in the right framework, you know, whether mm -hmm. it is your company policy, whether it is the law of the land, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, but being a guardian is the foremost duty of a in-house counsel so there's no ambiguity there uh, mm -hmm. fortunately i've been in organizations where uh, the core values and the ethics are more important than business so yeah. uh, as an organization you know uh, when the legal department is saying something they mm -hmm. have a seat at the table and mm -hmm. uh, you know right from the top management to our youngest colleagues they do listen and uh, then it's more a matter of, you know, our understanding what the business wants and trying to find ways to make it work. Okay, okay. Uh, so moving ahead, I would like to ask that, uh, how does your company support work-life balance for women uh, in all departments, whether it's legal or any other department, especially about the you know, flexible work arrangements that like yeah. any provisions that you have? So we do, uh, we have a very interesting concept of bringing our whole self to work, uh, you know, bringing your whole person. And as a person, we have our out of work responsibilities as well. Okay. Uh, so I'm really blessed to be a part of an organization where there is a lot of uh, flexibility in terms of work arrangements. If I talk about the legal function, we ever since uh, COVID happened, we have been classified as a hybrid function. So we do go to office, but it is on designated days. And that also, you know, it's more flexible. As long as the work is done, we are mm -hmm. not very hung up on from where are you working. 
Okay. Also, that is yeah. Good. Yeah, and also I think just because uh, as compared to a lot of other organizations, we have a lot of women in the in the company, mm -hmm. which provides you with an informal network, you know, of being able to reach out to people, just learn mm -hmm. from their experiences and uh, figure out ways of making things work. And honestly, I think in today's world, there's no concept of a work-life balance for anyone. It's all fluid, you know, it's all one thing. There are times when work has to take precedence and the rest of the life has to, you know, yeah. take a step back. And there are times when, you know, something happens in the family and work has to take a step back. So it's just a matter of prioritizing. But from an organization perspective, uh, it is very supportive. We focus a lot on building an open, authentic culture. And mm -hmm. everybody has a right to share their views, etc. And it is heard, which okay. is helps us keep on evolving as an organization okay okay uh, very well said uh so uh, corporate social responsibility is becoming an increase uh, like it's becoming increasingly important for all the companies so how does humans india under your legal guidance contribute to the social well-being and what are the initiatives that are uh, like taken uh -huh. so we have a Cummins india foundation we have been in India for more than 60 years and are very proud of uh, the work that we have done with the communities in India. Okay. And uh, the Cummins India Foundation has a plethora of projects that it focuses on right from, you know, working on education, working on inclusion, gender diversity, working with environment. There are multiple initiatives that uh, the organization is focused on. And uh, in fact, on our uh, website, anybody who's interested can easily find all the information that uh, uh, the Cummins India Foundation is doing. We partner with a lot of NGOs mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, you know, in our identified areas, uh, you know, whether it's education, whether it's environment, whether it's uh, gender diversity, there have been clear projects that long term projects that we have signed up for. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, we also have a Cummins College of Engineering. Oh, okay, okay. There are women, uh, you know, we have women who are, who enroll there and who uh, come out as engineers. Okay. So a lot of focus on STEM education for women as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I see there's a lack of women going to STEM careers. And that is something, I don't know why the guy that is happening in the whole world, not only in India. Yes. So yeah. And uh, one more thing that I like, uh, this is something pers very personal to me. Uh, men are just like cricketers or directors. But when, when it comes to women, you know, sometimes like I'm a woman journalist or you are a woman lawyer. So how do you take that? I mean, do you take an offend of that? Or you do, you, you're like, no, that's fine. I'm a woman lawyer. Yeah. Uh, so it happens. When I start, when I joined the profession, something that I heard very often is, oh, you're too soft-spoken to be a lawyer. <laughs> you just ignore it. And eventually, at least in my experience, your work and your attitude speaks and it stops mattering what your gender is. If you're bringing value to the conversation, mm -hmm. uh, I honestly believe that gender stops mattering after a while. It takes some time um, and sometimes it's uncomfortable being the only woman in the boardroom, mm -hmm. but uh, you have to ignore those facts and just keep your eyes focused on the deliverable, on the work. Make sure that you have enough allies in the room, uh, you have friends in the organization, etc. Mm -hmm. And over a period of time, uh, you know, I I honestly believe that work speaks for you. Okay, okay. Uh, so. Do you have any provisions to prevent sexual harassment at your workplace, at in your company? Yes, of course. Uh, by the law of the land, we do have all the relevant, uh, you know, internal committees in place, etc. But that is just one part of it. As an organization, we have very strong code of conduct, mm -hmm. and uh, across the globe, all, uh, organ, you know all our offices, etc., are bound to follow those policies, which in some cases are even more stringent than the law of the land. Okay, so both from great. our code of conduct, our internal policies, and just the statutes in India, 
we mm-hmm. do have a very clear and a robust process for preventing any such incidents. Okay, okay. That's really great to hear. And uh, now this one's a very, you know, off record question. Are you a binge watcher? And if you are, is there some legal show that you that's your personal favorite? I don't watch OTT. Okay. So I am more of a, uh, I read and in okay. the limited free time that, you know, I land up having, I prefer reading to watching OTT. So okay. no shows that I can talk about. Okay. Any any books that you would like to recommend me or our audiences? Uh, so I do have a lot of favorites. Uh, currently, for example, I'm reading this book by uh, Mr. Harari. And which talks about, you know, what the world is going to look like in future. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've really enjoyed reading books by President Obama. Uh, you know, have been very insightful. And uh, so a bunch of books are there, you know, whether it is on the legal profession, just on handling life. Uh, I also read a lot of uh, fiction, you know, when I need a stress buster. So it's just a mixture of uh, authors. Mm-hmm. And I always say I can... I land up reading everything. Uh, that's a really good habit. And I, I'm someone who like who is working on that to, you know, get that habit in. So yeah, that's really great to hear. So uh, lastly, I would like to ask that as someone who's so much respected in your field, what advice would you like to give to future lawyers and also someone who is just entering into the world and, you know, carving out a niche for themselves? What advice would you like to give them? So something that I have followed in my life is uh, uh, two things, actually. One is that you have to take your career seriously, because if you don't take your career seriously, and especially for a woman, Mm -hmm. nobody else will. And the second is just to take accountability for the choices that we make as individuals and own it and then just do our best. Uh, I'm not someone who is a great uh, in favor of you know entering into the victim mode so Mm -hmm. you take a decision you own it and then you make the best out of it okay okay that's that's really great something and something that I have I I don't like when people are self-victimizing themselves and um, that is really great to hear that you share the same views Uh, so yeah that's it thank you so much for talking to us ma'am and uh, thank you so much Thank you, Malvika. Pleasure being here and thank you for inviting me.